I think, you know, business has been extractive for hundreds of years. It has been driven by the exploitation of people and the earth and all kinds of things. And we haven't batted an eye at that. And in fact, we've rewarded it. And what's happening now, which is super exciting on a societal level, is the recognition that A, that doesn't work for us. Like that comes back to bite us. We're one humanity. We're one earth. It's easy to say, ah, too bad. So I think what's happening is businesses are slowly, slowly realizing that. Leaders are slowly realizing that. Politicians are much slower at realizing that. Customers have realized that. Employees have realized that. People want coherence. They want coherence and interdependence. They realize that to compartmentalize their values on Sunday with their kind of exploitative capitalistic practices Monday through Friday doesn't feel right. We don't want to do that. We can't sleep well. We can't look at our kids in the eye. This is Leading Up, a podcast from Udemy Business. Our guests share the advice, insights, and inspiration to help you transform as a leader. I'm Alan Todd, your host and the Vice President of Leadership Development at Udemy. Together, we can work, lead, and live differently. Aligning your personal values with those of your company is critical to making it through the ups and downs of everyday business life. It helps you power through the low periods and reminds you why you do what you do. This week on the podcast, we want to talk about how to be a force for good as a leader. It would be tough to find a better guest than Laylee Miller Murrow. She is an attorney, consultant, and social justice advocate who Newsweek and Daily Beast called one of the 150 most fearless women in the world. Goldman Sachs named her one of the top 100 most innovative entrepreneurs. The Washington Post gave her the award for management excellence. I could go on. Starting as a lawyer, Laylee advocated for human rights in the United States and around the world. She wrote a famous book, Do They Hear You When You Cry, about gender-based persecution based on a legal case she argued that changed asylum law for abused women. She was the founder and CEO of the Tahereh Justice Center, a social impact organization that helped over 31,000 women and children. She currently consults with organizations to improve social impact and deal with the broader environmental, social, and governance issues. Laylee, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. All right, let's get started. So you have this incredible leadership journey. How did you figure out you wanted to be in social justice? (laughs) <laughs> I think like like so many of us, we begin to figure things out in childhood. I had the honor of being raised in Atlanta, and I think it was an honor. I love the South and the warmth of the South. I worked for the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change. And there, starting as a high school student, I became really involved in issues of civil rights and human rights. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but somebody suggested that I go to law school. I had an immediate negative reaction. I wasn't sure lawyers were great for unity and for bringing people together and doing good. So I went in that direction really with the kind of cynical idea that I would just understand the system and know how to break it. But then what happened is I had the honor of representing incredibly courageous humans who were fighting for justice, and I realized I could help. And so that that became my calling. I'm wondering if you could talk, how does serving others make you a better leader? How does that feed your soul? Oh, gosh, that's such a great question. I I think it is the measure of good leadership right now. Humanity, fortunately, has evolved from models of leadership that were based on physical power and might, dominate and control and dictatorship. And we've migrated into realizing that building consensus, serving, leading by example, bringing up the best in others, helping to guide, helping to foster, helping to facilitate. All of these are really the qualities of good leadership. You have to sort of subjugate your ego to be a servant leader. And all of our cultural norms and media and stereotypes, like everything is about heroic leaders. And I think servant leaders, and, and again, I think you exemplify this concept of doing well by serving others. How do they quiet their ego to become better servants? 
I like that phrase you're using, quiet the ego, right? Because we all have ego. (laughs) There's no getting around ego. But to quiet it is, I think, a daily practice. I think that, you know, it's a lifelong journey. Our egos rear their head in moments. We think we get in control and then it comes right back. A couple of tactics, if you will, that I think are super helpful to that is surrounding yourself with people who make you uncomfortable with people who you respect, people who challenge you, people who will tell it to you like it is. Many people live in echo chambers. They hear what they want to hear and we protect comfort. But I think it's important for the ego to be uncomfortable, to embrace others who have different views. I think to adopt a posture of learning, continuous learning, helps the ego. You know, we all know the more you know, the more you know you don't know. (laughs) Right. I want to move to talk about purpose. And the frame that I found really fascinating was the business roundtable maybe two years ago. These are made up of the heavyweights, the Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan, Apple's Tim Cook, Mary Barra at General Motors. They changed the doctrine of shareholder primacy. That is, create value for shareholders, that's our reason for existence, to this idea of stakeholder primacy, which said, let's create value for customers and employees and the communities we serve and the planet and our shareholders. And they're talking about organizations serving a higher purpose, a purpose beyond making money. What does all that mean to you? It means we're evolving. (laughs) Slowly, but we're evolving. Yeah, I think, you know, business has been extractive for hundreds of years. It has been driven by the exploitation of people and the earth and all kinds of things. And we haven't batted an eye at that. And in fact, we've rewarded it. And what's happening now, which is super exciting on a societal level, is the recognition that A, that doesn't work for us. Like that comes back to bite us. We're one humanity. We're one earth. It's easy to say, oh, too bad. So I think what's happening is businesses are slowly, slowly realizing that. Leaders are slowly realizing that. Politicians are much slower at realizing that. Customers have realized that. Employees have realized that. People want coherence. They want coherence and interdependence. They realize that to compartmentalize their values on Sunday with their kind of exploitative capitalistic practices Monday through Friday doesn't feel right. We don't want to do that. We can't sleep well. We can't look at our kids in the eye. Slowly, we're developing a conscience around exploiting other people and other places. And we know that we have to make all of that work for our own selfish benefit, in fact, but also so that we're living a life coherent with our purpose and our values and our higher calling and sense of self. I think a lot of people have framed it as, you know, we've lost our way. We're getting softer. You invest, you know, how can you argue against shareholder primacy? And I think the way you framed it with coherence and interdependence is a really elegant way to think about it. Yeah, I would like to think that the main driver is coherence with values and interdependence with other human beings. What matters to the core of the business, what matters to investors who make no mistake, they're trying to make money. They are actually trying to make money. But what's brilliant is that customers are now prioritizing brand consciousness sustainability in the clothes that they buy, racial equity in the ice cream that they eat, you know, all of these kinds of things, you know, whether there's sexual harassment at a company and the cars that that company drives and their drivers, you know, all of these kinds of things, whether it's it's Uber or Ben and Jerry's or uh, Starbucks, so, so many. So there is now capital benefit, profit advantage to living a life of interdependence and value coherence. But it's still about making money. Now let's talk about the individual. We got the company and the purpose and all this stuff, but bring it back to the individual, kind of stressing about their values and how they align to the enterprise. How can they overcome it with regard to you know, their alignment of values and their company's values, their company's purpose? Well, there's a lot of research around Gen Z, for example, but also other generations who are valuing, in fact, their sense of inclusion and a work environment, their sense of purpose and how it aligns with their own values and what they do during the day over profit. 
an over salary margin. And, you know, if people want quality employees that bring a diversity of perspective and add monetary value to their bottom line, they are going to have to listen. They will have to allow this new generation to value work-life balance, for example, in ways that other generations sacrificed to allow for alignment with their company having a positive impact on the earth. This is what employees are demanding, but customers are too. And so that all affects the profit of a company. What do you advise someone to do to, you know, if they're trying to figure this out right now, aligning their values, do they write them down? Do they go talk to their boss? Do they quit and find another job? So I, I think that that can be a tricky thing because um, there's good marketing <laughs> and there's stuff that's shiny. And then there there is reality. When you dig under the hood, you look at the culture of the place, how their values are actually implemented or what a job really involves, you may be unpleasantly surprised. The converse can be true as well. So I would encourage people who are looking for jobs to look beyond title, to look at culture, ask how their values are being lived. What are the behaviors? What are some examples of behaviors or projects or products that demonstrate that a company has lived its values rather than the statement that was maybe written by a PR team that sits on their website? Yeah. And it seems there are more toxic workplaces than we think. And I find it interesting that you could join a humanitarian organization and still have a bad boss. I actually really do think, and I have seen this again and again, that people can transform their environment. And particularly if we believe that we're in the business of making a good impact on the world, it can start with your team. It can start with your work environment. And so I would also encourage, particularly young folks entering the work environment, don't give up too quickly or too easily. Make an investment, make an effort, genuinely bring up your concerns, offer kind of constructive solution-oriented ideas for things maybe you want to lead for your team to help them improve. So change management and culture change are perennial hot topics in business. And I've heard you talk about this idea of personal acts of defiance as the beginning of leading a cultural revolution. And I'm wondering if you could just explain what you meant by that. Sure. My observation of that truth is rooted in the work that I did at the Tahari Justice Center, where I witnessed again and again and again, amazingly courageous women who for the first time in their family, maybe for thousands of years, rejected cultural practices that were the norms. And that act of defiance sparked outrage, maybe it sparked conversation. The debate around their actions caused awakening, caused awareness, caused education. And then that spark was contagious. And so everyone is a change agent. It can be on a large cultural scale. It can be in an organization, but we are all change agents by our example, maybe by our defiance, by our constructive feedback, our offering solutions, or just suggesting a different way. So I always think about courage Courage is one of the cardinal virtues, you know, this is Cicero spoke of. How do you get the courage to be defiant? Like I've heard, you know, change agent as a term in the business world. And does it take a lot of courage? Is there a downside? Is there a risk? How do you weigh all of those factors in making that decision? I think that's a great question because you're right. Often there's blowback, but I would suggest two things. One is to not consider it defiance, but to consider it an act of service. Because when we want to improve something, hopefully it's not for only selfish reasons, but it's for the benefit that's larger. It's for the benefit of someone who's next in the same position that we are in, somebody else who may have suffered in the same way who shouldn't have to. And I actually think it comes across better when you see it that way, because when you see it or present it, as an act of defiance, I think that what you'll find is people armor up. There'll be defensiveness and there'll be rejection of the idea. But when you offer it in a spirit of service, 
in a way that might benefit other people, people can be more receptive to that. The other way I would suggest looking at that, in addition to being of service, is having it something that may benefit you, but primarily would benefit others. So if you come at the suggestion to say, this may benefit me in my own job, but what I'm mostly worried about is how it's affecting these other teams, how it's affecting the whole organization and our bottom line. Even taking yourself out of it, maybe even, and this is an ultimate act of service, particularly impactful when it comes from people with power and privilege who benefit from the way things are, to say, this might even mean my job has to change. This might even mean I take a pay cut because it's not equitable the way we're doing things right now. I think when we approach it that way, it's not so much about defiance in a way that immediately sparks defensiveness or rejection. It's about helping accompany each other in our evolution as human beings and as organizations. So we've talked about kind of the purpose-driven organization, that high level. We've talked about the individual. Let's talk about work life today on a team. For example, how to have better meetings. We did some research on this over the last 12 months with the conference board and University of Michigan RBL consultants, like a whole group of people and just leading in a hybrid world. And one of the things we found is that people really feel disconnected. They're having a tougher time because you're not walking the halls. The glue isn't quite as strong as it was that bound us together as coworkers or colleagues. And as a result, people feel that sense of belonging is, is, is lessening. And so one of the interventions that we've studied that works is the idea of trying to be more inclusive or run more inclusive meetings. I know this is something you've given a lot of thought about. So why don't you uh, start by just telling us your thoughts on, on running better meetings, more inclusive meetings? Yeah, I think one of the gifts that COVID gave us is it has forced us to be intentional. Because I, I agree with you. I think that when people could walk the halls so or they could pop into somebody's office, they could look at each other in the eye, um, kind of rub elbows during meetings. There was an organic level of team building that happened, but that kind of team building benefited people who were outgoing. It benefited people who had a lot in common with each other. It benefited certain personalities and certain demographics. What COVID allowed was like a leveling of the playing field. And it allowed for people to have to be really intentional on Zoom. Now, I also think that there's something magical about in-person that can't be replaced by Zoom. But I think that what we're given now is the gift of both and the ability to do both and the ability to be more strategic. And so you think the new digital way is more equitable? Like, let's say through the lens of extrovert versus introvert, you think that that has balanced the field? Absolutely. I, just to give you an example that, that may be a bit ridiculous, uh, in my organization that I ran for 20 years, we had lawyers and we had social workers. We had people whose English was their first language and we had people for whom English was their second or their third or fourth language. And, you know, as a lawyer with English as your first language, who was trained in debate skills. Now, you know, what that means is that lawyers are trained to interrupt people, uh, speak more loudly, speak with a lot of confidence, even if they have no idea what they're saying. Not helpful for trust, not helpful for team building, not helpful for participatory dialogue based consensus decision making. Then we had social workers who are trained in inclusive language. They are trained in reflective listening skills. They were trained to not interrupt. They were trained to listen deeply. So very unfortunate, mostly unfortunate for the social workers. These folks had to be in the same room at the same time. Now, when we were on Zoom, people who were like leaning forward and would normally do that on top of the table in order to interrupt someone's train of thought and start speaking couldn't do that on Zoom. And in an environment where everyone is muted until they're called on, interruptions stopped. In an environment where you could actually keep track and do analytics on how many people had spoken and for how long. So it allowed for intentionality that was helpful. Yeah, I love it. It's so powerful. And I, you know, I've had this just an observation that 
extroverts have been chosen for high potential for so long because, you know, people pick people like themselves. And so you had these tended to be white male and extroverts as leaders, but the whole system was built around who are the high potentials and you identified people like that. And one of the things that we've seen through online education is exactly what you just described, Laylee, which I think has been just amazing with online leadership development is we start to get completely colorblind, race blind, gender blind, because you can't see that in a structured asynchronous dialogue, people with good ideas that get a lot of people to follow or like or reply, it really comes down to the quality of the conversation, the quality of the ideas, the quality of the arguments. And it's it's been the, probably one of the coolest things I've gotten to see. So let's talk about, you mentioned participatory decision-making. Let's talk about harnessing the collective genius of a team. How do you do that? Yeah, it, that, it's such an important topic because there's a lot of science that proves that diverse teams make the best decisions. And every company is the sum total of the decisions it makes. So value, profit, all comes back to how companies make decisions and how leaders lead in decision making. There are very tangible, tactical ways to do it. They are at a structural level to make sure that the right people are in the right room at the right time. But then there are also soft skills, how people interact, how people ask questions, how they analyze problems, how they facilitate meetings, how they manage for really tough situations that come up. So there's a lot of soft skill involved, but then there's also structural design that you can do in order to set things up for the greatest and most inclusive decisions. So talk about that structural thing. So give me a couple things you can do to be more inclusive. You you have some methodological ideas here. Yeah. So one of the structural things that you can do to be more inclusive is first to look at the type of decision you're about to make. Is this something that will affect lots of people in the organization or only a few? Is this a decision that will be permanent or temporary? There's an analysis you can go through to look at factors like that to help decide whether this is a decision that you could make by several different types of participatory decision making. One type is vote. Maybe just get a vote from everybody, make it super quick. Then there are things like a strategic plan for an organization where virtually everyone will have wisdom and have value to add to the future direction of the organization. In that case, you want a rather complicated process that allows for advisory input by the maximum number of people possible. You want a decision-making body that is consensus-based, that has representation from different levels of the organization. There are other types of decision called advisory input. As a manager, perhaps, it's your sphere of influence. You know that the buck stops with you on making a decision. But I, my view is it's never wise to make a decision in a silo alone. So those are just three different types of participatory decision-making at a structural level that one can employ. There are several others, but I think I'll keep it simple for now. All right, we're coming up towards the end, and I want to see if we can find a way to segue into ESG. I see your work in social impact that you've done. How do you take the S and, and sort of build out ESG. How do you define it? How did you get there? And let's see if we can unpack that a little. So my career now is really focused on the world of ESG, environmental, social, and governance impact, particularly around the S component, social impact. It's a natural evolution from what I used to do, having focused on human rights and equity. My frontier used to be the government. And it became clear to me early on, that the government, for reasons having to do with stagnating partisan politics, paralysis that is existing in a lot of political systems throughout the world, particularly the United States, that companies were actually on the front line of human rights. They had an amazing ability to have impact on a completely different scale. Yeah. I want to bring it all together by going back to this original question we talked about and just get your thoughts. So the whole idea of ESG investing right now is is controversial, right? Where do you see all that going? 
it's clear that employees are choosing companies based on their public brand reputation, based on their ESG commitments. Customers are choosing products based on ESG metrics and measures, their impact on the environment, their track record on social issues, their ethics and transparency and governance practices. All of these kinds of things are absolutely true. So as we wrap up here, we have a question that we ask all of our guests, and that is personally or professionally, however you want to answer it, what are you curious about and learning now? It's just such a constant and and humbling, very humbling thing. But I also am really relishing my shift, my professional shift from the NGO world, the non-governmental organization world, into a corporate environment where people very sincerely are trying to make an impact and, and very authentically looking for effective and efficient ways to do that. So I feel like I'm just soaking up new knowledge, new information, and learning from so many amazing people right now. That's great. Lily, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to Leading Up, a podcast from Udemy Business. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode to help you level up your leadership skills. Follow the show so you never miss a new episode. And if you like the show, leave a rating or a review. We love the feedback and it really helps us find new listeners. To learn more about Leading Up or how Udemy can help you develop leaders at scale and move business forward, visit business.udemy.com. The Leading Up podcast is produced by Udemy in partnership with Pod People. Special thanks to our production team, Alex Vickmanis, Amy Machado, Brian Rivers, Danielle Roth, and Carter Wogan. Our original theme is by Soundboard. Soundboard.